I was just looking at him. He's on the railing that goes downstairs. Scares me when he gets there. He fell one time. <laughs> Betty landed on his feet, though. <laughs> yeah, he did. We got eight more times. <laughs> and he'll do that unless he hits his head on the handrail, and then it kind of knocks him out. I know that from experience, from cat experience. Wow. They'll just keep doing it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Jason Burton and his wife bought a house in Roanoke a few years ago, and their dog it didn't have a rail on the stairway and the dog fell off the top of the stairway so they had to have somebody come in and build them a handrail on their stairway for the dog oh my goodness <laughs> dog rail huh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And rails at this house mm. nobody fell but we were careful <laughs> okay. mm. Oh, Ted and Donna. Early. Good morning, Hi, good morning. Shirley. Hi, Marie. Hey, Donna. Hey, Ted. Hey. Gary, when is Pajama Sunday? <laughs> um. Well, you know, if, if they if everybody were honest, we'd have them to stand up and show us. But <laughs> I think I told I think I told the class several weeks ago. I was doing a, in July. We did a online delivery of this course that I teach through LSU, and uh, we had a lady there who was the vice president of academic affairs at uh, Charleston Southern University, and we were just having an informal conversation before we started class one morning, and. She said, I have a, per a burning question for everyone. And everybody said, what? And she said, how many of you are wearing your pajamas? <laughs> and surprising how many actually were. There were 20 in the class. And, and it was at least about 50%. So. <laughs> uh, maybe the first big snow Sunday. There you we go. could wear our pajamas. That sounds good. But this, this is the Sunday that we should have, because this is the, the last Sunday that is going to be so very dark yeah so before the time changes next week yeah. <laughs> good on the morning side not so good on the evening side right oh, yeah. Yeah. have to drive home in the dark yeah mm -hmm. i had an interesting visit to pulaski county middle school this week i was headed up that way so i decided to just stop in and see how you know restrictive they were and went in, they said, well, you have to talk to the principal. And she said, it's okay if I walked around. I said, I wouldn't encounter anybody. The kids were in class. So I got to look through windows into classes and see the, all the nice building. It's really nice. And she told me that uh, the security guard told me that it had zero cases with faculty and, and students at the middle school. They only had one with a faculty member at the high school at that point. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sure. Did you know that Evan Winesett played a role in the building of that school and the design of that school? No. Yeah, he as a junior class president, he automatically qualified to be on the study team that traveled around Virginia looking at other schools to find a plan that was just right for Pulaski County. And they found this plan in Northern Virginia and went with that. And, and so he met with the planning board and uh, all through that period of time. And he said, once the county voted to, um, you know, pay the taxes to build it, increase the taxes to build it, he said they started getting all kinds of inquiries from businesses looking to relocate to the area. So. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Where it's located is rather undeveloped. Yeah. Uh, there's a few homes here and there, but, uh, and there's Cougar Express, but not much else out there. So. It's, going to, it's going to look different in five years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start if that's okay with everyone. And um, what I want to do is take care of a little administrative detail. And, you know, uh, we've talked about just briefly the fact that next Sunday we actually conclude um, we make the road by walking. And so we, we have about 
two Sundays or so, believe it or not, before we start into the Advent study. And so what my plan is, is to uh, teach a couple of classes in that, in that interim time that sort of uh, hopefully will get us a little bit in the framework and the mindset for, uh, for Advent. And then what I would like to do, I think uh, uh, our class for, for a very long time has used Nurturing Faith and, and everybody seems to like it because uh, the material is really, really, really well done and there are lots of additional resources uh, that are available online. And uh, so unless there are any strong objections, I, I think that's the way that we would go. Now to help us out with that, I'm going to post a, a poll here and all you have to do is you'll click yes, no, or unsure, just to give me and Kent some kind of an idea of how many of you currently receive it um, by the mail, by US Postal Service, uh, so that we can be sure and add you to the subscription so that you can begin getting uh, the copies for it. Uh, and that will take a little time to, to get them notified. Of, well, you know, you've dealt with subscriptions before, so <laughs> we wanna be sure that everybody has has the material when we start the uh, first of the year. So let me pop this poll up here. And if you will, just take your, take your mouse or if you've got a touch screen, touch uh, yes, no. And if you're unsure, let us know that as well. There are copies of it that are available uh, in the church. But with church, our circumstances of being able to uh, get access to, this, to the church being what they are, um, you know, that's not a really good option for a lot of folks. So if you'll go ahead and, and, and make that. And I'm going to assume that where there are couples involved, you all are both doing, it applies to two. You don't have separate mailboxes in those. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, I'm seeing um, 11, I'm seeing 12. Okay, that's all of us. So it looks like, Kent, that we have um, most, most of our group does not have it. Of the, uh, okay, Kent, what I will do is I've got, um, I've got my emailing address that has a pretty good list of all, of everybody, we can compare it and, and go from there. Good. Okay. Great. Somebody, a new phone just came on. On the screen. It's one eight four five nine one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's Esther. Uh huh. Morning, Esther. Hey guys. Guys, this is Mary Ann. Are we having trouble with Zoom this morning? We don't no. see your picture. Okay. okay. So you're joining us by telephone. Yes, because I couldn't get on Zoom. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Uh, do you all receive Nurturing Faith in the mail? Yes. Okay. All right. So that's five. Uh, Esther, do you receive uh, Nurturing Faith in the mail? Probably not because she's in our old Sunday school class. Okay. okay. She's unless, you pick it up, unless you pick it up by the door. Yeah. Okay. That that's helpful. Um, so so we will um, we'll go we'll go do that. Uh, Gary, are we having trouble with Zoom this morning? Yeah. No. I beg your pardon. I, I said yes. I heard. Oh, you. okay. Because okay, because I couldn't log on uh, via my computer, so I, I no. thought maybe it was my computer. Marianne, um, actually, it doesn't appear that anybody else is having trouble with Zoom. There are 15 participants, and you're the only one that's joined by phone. Oh, okay. So maybe it is from my end then. You may okay. want to shut your computer all the way down and restart it to see yeah. if that will work. Okay. All righty. I'll do that. We had to get a faster Wi-Fi router this week because ours was doing it. Okay. Well, um, while we have Kent here, as usual, uh, Kent, could you uh, bring us up to date on our prayer concerns or sure. any news that you'd like for us to be aware of? Um, I have just two, uh, two updates on the prayer list. Uh, Dennis Pascal, I don't know how many of you actually were able to hear 
what I said Thursday night at the start of the hymn sing. Um, it, it appeared that some people couldn't get on initially, uh, and yet the recordings for Facebook and YouTube show that we were on from the very start. So I don't know what was going on there, but Dennis Pasco had some follow-up surgery on Friday. Um, and that went very well. He was already home Friday night. Uh, it was a side effect of his previous treatments, but uh, it looks good. He just has to keep walking and exercising to not get stiff and sore. But uh, that, that was, they were very upbeat about the results of that. Um, I learned yesterday that Melvin Fleeman, who lives full-time in Roanoke at, at a retirement center now, has been tested positive for COVID-19. Oh, wow. Um, oh, and no. has have quite a few other residents in the community where he oh. lives. We want to remember Melvin in our prayers, and I will be trying to get up with him this week to see where things are. That's what I have. Okay. Uh, any of you have any additions or, or updates on some folks that you're aware of? Muted. I've got a couple that I'll hold them too. You can talk. <clears throat> Patty Lydon's husband is doing well now. Good. Yes. Good. Yes. He's in remission. Great. Uh, Kay and I went to Roanoke yesterday and uh, had lunch with Lauren and Maggie and Lauren's mother, Patty, for whom you all have been praying quite a bit here lately. And she is not getting a whole lot better, but she, her, her mind and her spirit are just amazingly strong. Uh, it's just that her physical body is just, it's, it's, it's not working for her. Uh, so please keep Patty in your prayers. Uh, she's a sweet lady. She's, uh, she's a very devout, very strong Christian lady. And uh, she's, she's got more challenges than most of us could ever even dream of from a physical standpoint. And of course that plays over, I'm sure, and to her emotional health as well. And then uh, I've got a uh, joyful praise today. Um, Miss Kay turned 25 today. <laughs> we, got, we got married when I was 12. So, uh, so you know, just... Uh, if, I didn't know you were from Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Kentucky. I can well, say no being xenophobic on us here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, really? uh, yeah. uh, but that was that was the main reason, really, that we went to Roanoke yesterday. Okay. Any others? That's uh, being in prayer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, please, please be in prayer. The deacons will meet tonight and start our new deacon year, and it's uh, very important. Well, they all are, but this is a super important year, I think, for our church. So please be in prayer for the deacons. Thank you. I would add to that, uh, we have our first meeting of the uh, pastor search committee this coming Thursday night. And uh, need I say more? Uh, <laughs> same, same thing. We, we definitely covet, covet not only your prayers, but uh, your guidance and support. It's a very challenging job. But it's an exciting job because uh, there, there's some really wonderful things happen in that process. Some of you may have served on one. I only served on one. Um, any others? We need to be aware of our friends in the, in the West who are suffering through the fires. Uh, there's a storm, another one in the Gulf that uh, are heading to the Gulf that looks like it may make landfall, but it's not going to be a real major storm, but uh, given all the water they've got, particularly in South Louisiana and along the southern Gulf Coast, uh, that always portends something that could be pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, has, that, has that been upgraded to a tropical storm? I think that it has been. Uh, I haven't checked uh, this morning specifically, but it, they, they were projecting that it would. Yes, okay. Yes, because they named it today. Oh, What's really? the name? Sure. What's they the name? named it for sure. <laughs> They have named it. Yes. What's the name? Epsilon, I think. Data. No, it's Data. Data. Oh, it's Data. 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 Okay. Data. I wasn't listening, but with half an ear. <laughs> Data. All right. Any others? The election's coming up. Please vote. Please be in prayer for 
all of those who are not only seeking office, but those who are currently serving, that they keep in mind that they serve, they serve the people, they serve our country. Um, so we need to support them. And uh, so let's be, let's be prayerful about doing that. Take some time in prayer before we start. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks this morning for the many, many, many wonderful, wonderful things that you uh, bestow on us as gifts that, that pour out of your grace and your love for us. We enjoy uh, blessings that are so bountiful, we literally cannot keep up with them. But we know that in the midst of, of being so, such a blessed people, that there are countless thousands of others who are suffering under uh, the real, real pressures and woes and, and uh, grief of, of the pandemic, who are suffering from wildfires, who are threatened by storms, who are fearful because of uh, their lives in war-torn countries. Uh, we all have a fear of terrorist activities and so many other things that hang over us in such a dreadful, dreadful, demeaning way. Help us to always keep our eyes focused on you and, and help us to know and to understand that uh, there's nothing that's gonna happen to us today that you and I together cannot handle. And that with you on our side, we, we have a strength that we can never even begin to appreciate nor understand. And we are so grateful to you for being such a God of care, a God of love and a God of concern. You've been here, you know who we are, you know what we're suffering through. And having that knowledge, you know how to help us walk through those dark times. We ask that you would be particularly near to those whom we've mentioned by name this morning, those who are on our prayer list at church, and those whom we bring to you in our hearts. <clears throat> give them hope, give them that sense of, of understanding that through the presence of your Holy Spirit, they can face difficulties that are challenging them in so many different ways. We thank you for our church. We thank you for every member of our church who has uh, accepted the call to assume a position of leadership on, on our teams, on our committees, uh, teaching, serving in so many wonderful, wonderful ways. And we pray especially for those folks and we pray for all members of our church who are giving themselves as best they can with the talents that, and the resources that you've given them. Guide our deacon fellowship and guide our pastor search committee, knowing that you already are preparing the one whom you, we will call to become the next pastor of our church. And we ask for your divine leadership and your divine grace as we stumble through that process, but uh, always forgive us for those mistakes that we make, but always continue to support and lead and guide us as we ultimately come to the goal that you have for us. Be with us as we study because we know we're limited in that. We need to know more about your word. We need to have a much more uh, deeper understanding of what your word really means so that given the opportunity, we can share that faithfully and truthfully with others. Help us become students of the Bible, of your word, to listen carefully and critically to those who uh, themselves try to share that understanding with us. So be with us as we continue to serve and walk with you as a fellowship of believers. Be with all of those whom are, who are in our hearts and in our thoughts and prayers today. And be with us at these moments as we look into your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we lift this prayer. Amen. Yeah. All right. I'm going to shut your microphone off. Today's lesson is one that I'm going to show you a picture because, you know, so many times a picture can inform us in ways that we can't even begin to understand. And there's also a, a teaching technique that's called an advance organizer. And what it serves to do is to give those who are learning, who are in a class, whatever it might be, a sense of really what is the true focus of the lesson or whatever it is that, that, that's being taught and that they're going to be led uh, to know and to understand. So I'm gonna show you this graphic. It's a little bit humorous, but when you think about the message in the humor, uh, that gives you a sort of a, I think a very, very good idea of what we're gonna be talking about. So here you go. 
Look closely. Look closely. I see some smiles, so some of you are getting it. I've used this a number of times over the years in different kinds of situations and classes and uh, different things that I've done. And it's interesting to see the reactions to it. The book of Revelation is a piece of apocalyptic literature. Apocalypse means uh, a revealing or a showing or uh, unveiling, if you will. And the thing about the book of Revelation, our, our, our Revelation, no S, our class made a study of it several years ago, and it scared me to death to have to get involved with it. But the more I got involved studying and preparing to, to teach the class from it, the more I began to understand that I have been uh, listening too closely to people who I think make a, a very, very grave mistake by trying to spend a whole lot of time understanding all of what they perceive to be the different kinds of hidden codes that are embedded in that particular book. Now, there may be some, but I think there are some messages that speak beyond any kind of uh, uh, esoteric or secret or coded kinds of messages that all of that stuff just serves to clutter up what it is that God really wants us to learn from his word as John presented it in that book of Revelation. And so the theme is never give up, never, ever give up. Let's get a context, a historical context. When John was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos, he was, he was fortunate in one sense because uh, the emperor Domitian literally had the, the, the prerogative to actually kill him, but he chose to exile him instead. What had happened over time as the, as the Roman Empire continued to increase and increase and increase in its power, it also began to show signs of decay and decadence because uh, those who were in positions of power and, and uh, influence were so overcome by things that had nothing to do with what they were called to do as leaders, as monarchs, whatever. And so the country was having, uh, experiencing some very, very difficult internal problems. And so when emperors assumed their particular thrones, they spent as much time trying to protect themselves and protect their power as they did trying to help the people. And so many times misguided leaders will use strength and power rather than words and negotiations and compromise to solve problems and to make things work a little bit better. So in this particular case, the emperor had destroyed the temple. He had sent the Jews away, many of them, particularly those who hadn't been killed just to get them out of the way. And then he turned his attention to the Christians. For a very long period of time after the birth of Christ, uh, Christians enjoyed some of the immunity from uh, the threats from the emperor simply because of the fact that they were such a far flung uh, part of the whole uh, Roman Empire that the emperor did not want to cause problems because he didn't want to have to deal with those people way out there in the hinterlands. And so he sort of gave a little bit of grace, not a whole lot, but a little bit of grace to the Jews. So when the Christian faith started to emerge and started to grow, the emperor just thought of it as just sort of a, a, a subgroup of, of the Jewish religion. So they were given a little bit of grace, but that didn't last very long. As the emperor sought to gain greater and greater and greater power, they did so by destroying those who were who gave any kind of a hint of a threat to their position. We've read stories, we've seen the movies, we've done all of those other kinds of things about that period in history. And the emperors at the time were so intent on destroying Christians that they persecuted them at levels that we could never even begin to comprehend. The Roman Colosseum was a center for entertainment and the source of entertainment was to see lions and gladiators literally tear Christians to pieces. So it's into this environment that John writes this extended letter. And it's out of this letter 
that we learned exactly what that little comic cartoon thing I showed you was trying to uh, teach us. Don't ever give up. In spite of all the things that you find around you that are scary, that are horrifying, that are destructive, never give up because God is still in control regardless of what may be going on around us in the midst of all kinds of chaos that's out there. God's always in control and God is going to ultimately, ultimately rule. There are sections in, in Revelation where uh, John speaks of a confrontation between God and Satan. And Satan is coded to mean Rome, which is okay because Rome, in my estimation, was the personification of evil, as is Satan. And so what we find that we need to look at is some of the things that give us this spirit of hope, this sense of being able to overcome what is going on around us. So if I can paraphrase what John is trying to write, it could be this, hang in there. Yep, things are bad. They're not likely to get a whole lot better. In fact, they're likely to get a little bit worse. The good news is that God is in charge and it's God who will ultimately have the last word. So be brave, keep the faith and never lose sight of the vision for which we strive, the kingdom of God on earth. Never ever lose sight of the vision for which we strive, the kingdom of God on earth. Where there is no vision, the people suffer. Where there is no vision, uh, uh, life for people becomes very, very chaotic. There's a great line from uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. And you see this beautiful picture, it's a really funny picture actually, of the Cheshire cat sitting up in a tree with his tail hanging off and the cartoonist, you know, make it wag a little bit. And Alice is there and so he's questioning Alice about what she's doing and she wants to find her way out of there. And he says, well, how are you going to do it? She says, I don't know. And then he says this wonderful line, he says, if you don't care where you're going, then any road will do. As Christians, there's a message for us. If we don't care where we're going, if we don't have a vision about where we're going, we're never going to make it. We're never going to go to a place that we can say, yep, I've arrived. This is where I want to be. We're going to be working. We're going to go to dead ends. We're going to go to roundabouts. We're going to go to all sorts of other kinds of things that are going to simply overwhelm us. The other thing is, is if we try to do this under our own power, the chances are very, very good that we're not going to make it. We always have to be uh, minded of the fact, reminded of the fact that God is the one who's in, in, in control. We've developed a wonderful vision for this church. And if we ever, ever lose sight of that vision, we're never going to meet the ultimate goal that we've set for ourselves as a fellowship. We may want to change it because times change. And as times change, we may see the need to uh, maybe change our direction a little bit. But if we do that under God's leadership, as opposed to following one of our whims, the chances are good we're not going to make it. Well, the thing is, is that we've all made mistakes. And we're probably going to continue to make mistakes because that's just who we are. We're not perfect. We're not fallible. But in fact, what we have to find ourselves to, uh, to come to the understanding of the fact is that we have to change. The wonderful, beautiful thing about God is we can always, always change. There is nothing in our past that we have done that is so bad that God won't forgive us and walk with us and direct us, mold us and make us into the child that he would have us to be. We can always change. And that's what Revelation is about. Listen to what the scripture says. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We've all said, I have many, many, many times. Lord have mercy. I look back over my 76 years and I think about dumb things that I did, bad decisions that I made. And I think, good gracious, can God still love me for some of the things that I did, for things that I've said? And I've come to the real, realization in terms of where I am right now, the answer is yes. God is always willing and ready and waiting to receive us and to forgive us. I think if I ever write a, a book of mem memoirs of my life, I'm going to uh, see a number of things that I probably would like to just go back and do over. The real dumb things I've done, the words I've said that I really should not have said, things that I should have done but did not do. But if we dwell on that too long, we miss out on a chance for happiness. We miss out on the opportunity to really sort of redirect who we are, to put our lives back in order and get back on the path that God has laid out for us, both individually and corporately. We'll say that, that kind of statement every year when we come to a new year. We make all these resolutions and it begins usually with, from now on, and you fill in the rest of it, we're going to make changes, things are going to happen. And we're all inspired to do that. We're all pumped up and ready to go. And then a month later, we've usually forgotten about them. H.G. Wells, in his autobiography, said an interesting thing. At the beginning of each of the seven chapters, the first seven chapters in the book, he begins with the words, I started over again. And that's exactly what, what we can do. The question is, where do we start? That's a very, very good question. It's sort of the question that the Deacon Fellowship will address tonight. It's the question that the Pastor Search Committee will address Thursday night. Where do we start? What do we do first? And when we're thinking about changing the course of our lives, when we start thinking about trying to get better aligned with God and in tune and in touch with God. Where do we start? Look at the scriptures. Look at the scripture. You probably already anticipated this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Rely on God. Seek God. Follow his leadership, and the pieces will fall right into place. You don't have a thing to worry about. Behold, I'm making all things new. We have to rededicate our lives to God, rededicate our lives to God in ways in which uh, we set a pattern for not just believing, but living out that belief, for living out those changes that we're making. There's Miss Marianne. And that is so, so, so very essential. And again, we come to the scriptures to try to help us get a better handle on that understanding. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. And what he was doing was trying to get them to understand that when we put Christ first and honor him as the Lord of our lives, we can never be the same. Our lives are forever different. Look at what he said. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Does that sound like an echo of revelation? It definitely does. And that's a word of encouragement. 
It's a word of comfort, but equally important, it is a word of hope. It is a word of hope. As long as a person has hope, they're going to be okay. It's when people lose hope that they start getting themselves into trouble. All of us, even as children, as our children grew up, as our grandchildren have grown up, have played with this little song that uh, sometimes we probably take the words very, very lightly. We really ought to maybe give a lot better, a lot of closer attention to them. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. We are weak in all that we do. There's no way we can be equal to God. There is, there is absolutely no way that we can achieve who God is and come to the same level as he is. But the glory of that understanding is that God's on our side. He's on our team. That's just as good. In fact, for me, that's better because I'm going to follow him not try to follow my own dumb ideas and my own dumb whimsical way of going about achieving different kinds of things. And if you don't believe God can change, let's go to the Bible because he has, he has, and he continues to do that. God began the world with creation. And what did he say? He said, it's good. He created humanity and he said, oh, it's very good. He began humanity with Adam and Eve. And of course, we know what they did. God gave them clothes after he uncovered their sins, sent them away, and then he began all over again. The world became just such a horrible, terrible place. God called out Noah, had him build an ark, put himself and all the animals in it, and sent them out, sent a flood, and God started all over again. As time went on, he chose another man named Abraham, pulled him out of a life of comfort, a life of ease, a life in which he had more creature comforts than anyone could ever, ever hope. And he said, I'm going to send you to a place you've never heard of. Trust me, everything's going to be good. I'm going to make a nation out of you that your descendants will outnumber the stars in the heavens. So he sent him to the promised land, but then they were, the people were taken into bondage, bondage into Egypt. He got them out and started all over again. And then God in his own time, according to his own plan, according to his own holy will, he sent the very absolute best he could get together. He sent his son. And his son was bringing a word of good news. His son was bringing a word of comfort, a word of inspiration, a word of motivation, of encouragement, of hope. And out of that message, out of that word, came salvation and hope for eternal life. A new heaven and a new earth. No more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. I am making everything new. I'm the alpha, I'm the omega, I'm the beginning, and I'm the ending. I am, is what he said to Moses. And as we read Revelation and we read these words, I think for me, I get a better understanding as Moses asked God, what who who are you going to say sent I'm going to have to say sent me. I am sent you. And I get a better understanding of who I am is through looking at this word here. So what we have to keep in mind is that this God of new beginnings, this God who's willing to start all over, is more concerned about our future than he is about our past. Behold, all things have passed away. I'm making everything new. The slate is clean. Here we go. C.S. Lewis, who I love, I don't know if you've read many of his writings, but 
he was an agnostic at best and maybe even a little bit of, a, of an atheist before he was converted to the Christian faith. Listen to what he says here. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman, Roman Empire. The great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Now, I love the conclusion here. Aim at earth, and you will not even get earth. We have to keep our minds and our eyes and our hearts and our souls focused on what God has in store and what is his great plan and his great directive for us. And how are we going, how are we going to be engaged in that great work that he is going to be setting for us? He's got a vision. What we have to do is buy into that vision and become so absolutely convicted of it that there's nothing that's going to sway us from following through on it. If we think about this incredible creation, minus some of the scars that are there that largely we have created, it's just such a marvelous, marvelous thing a marvelous thing that God has bestowed on us to become stewards of. God has given us that opportunity to be his people here, to be working alongside him in the building of his kingdom. And so when we come to that realization, in my mind, that ought to give us a little bit of an impetus to change our attitudes toward one another here and now. Have you ever thought about the fact that the people that you run, run into, that you encounter at various and sundry different kinds of things uh, in the present, in the past, and anticipating what's going to happen in the future? Many of them are going to be in eternity with us. Don't we want to bring others along with us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But think about what that message says to how we should be relating to each other. Because that's the big piece of this starting over. It is for me anyway. So many of the things that I, I have a sense of guilt about in my, in my life are things that I did that uh, harmed other people. I don't mean I hurt anybody physically. I disappointed other people. And most importantly, I disappointed myself. And so we have to be careful about how we take care of each other as we are in this process of taking care of ourselves, renewing ourselves, realigning ourselves with who God wants us to be. So how do we wrap this thing up? I think we keep in mind first and foremost that the message here in John's writing in Revelation is hope. It's there. It's real. It's not some nice sounding word that uh, makes us sort of feel good in the moment. But it's a word of encouragement. It's a word of, of comfort. It is a word that serves to lead us more and more to be greatly involved in that vision, both in the immediacy of where we are as a fellowship and in the larger picture as members of God of Christ's great church, as we become involved in making that vision, that kingdom on earth become truthfully, truthfully a reality. Over the years since the writing of Revelation, as I said before there, a lot of people have spent an inordinate amount of time trying to say, oh, this word means this, and it means that in the year so-and-so, uh, the world's going to come to an end. That's the wrong use of God's scripture. We're trying to use God's scripture to satisfy human 
human wishes and human desires and we leave God out of it completely. And God is probably shaking his head and saying, where did they get that? That's not what I mean. That's not what I'm here for. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else is going to be added to it. And it's just like we've said in previous lessons. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. If you're with me, I'm with you. We're going to make it through this thing. And all is going to be well. Trust me. I promise. And out of that promise comes that sense, that evidence, you will, of hope. When we think about what McLaren tried to communicate with us, he was talking with us, I think, about coming to this understanding of exactly what hope is all about and what this whole thing of making everything new is truthfully all about as well. God was coming down to be among us. God was coming down to dwell with us. God is going to reassure us time and time and time again and show us without any misunderstandings whatsoever that he's with us. So as John was writing to these people in troubled times, and what he told them was true then, and I think it's definitely true today. We live in very difficult times. There are so many, so many different kinds of uh, circumstances, situations out there that, that seemingly the lid could blow off at any given moment. And McLaren right, reminds us that it doesn't matter how much chaos is going on around us. We've got to remember, and I like the words he uses here, God's river of life is flowing now. God's river of life. True aliveness is available now. That's why Revelation ends with the sound of a single word echoing through the universe. That word is not wait, nor is it not yet, or someday. It is a word of invitation, Welcome, reception, hospitality, and possibility. It is a word not of ending, but of new beginning. That one word is come. The Spirit says it to us. We echo it back together with the Spirit. We say it to everyone who is willing. Come. Can't you see God standing there with his hands out, his arms open, wanting to hug us, saying, come. Come. Then the one sitting on the throne said, Behold, I am making the whole creation new. New world, new me, new you. And that ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. That's all I've got for today. have a conversation. Mary Ann, it's good to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's good to good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very good lesson, Gary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was wonderful. Yep. Uh, Gary, Revelation has all revelation has always frustrated me because uh, of all the uh Secret things that were supposed to be in there, and, and I just couldn't figure out why they put that in the Bible because you would study and study, come up with your idea, but someone else would have a different idea, you know, and, and who knew who was right. And when I read that little summary last night, when I was reading the lesson, and I read that little summary, I was like, that's it, that's all you need to know about Revelation. And I immediately printed it out. And cut it out and put it in my Bible at the very beginning of Revelation. So that whenever I, I go back there to read something, I'll have that little uh, piece there to remind me when I, when I really need to know. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. That was very helpful to me. I never shall forgot, forget that uh, uh, we had not had our first television which I won't tell you what year that was, but um, 
the screen was was not teeny tiny, but it was not big big either, and it was black, and there was more snow in it than there was picture. Mm -hmm. uh, but every Sunday morning before we would go to church, there was this uh, what we now call a televangelist who was on, and he would get on there and start deep trying as he would call it decoding Revelation, mm -hmm. and it scared me so much that I would not read in the Book of Revelation until in early adulthood. Yeah. I said. I'm not going to read that stuff. It's hocus pocus. I, I'm not, I don't want to hear that. And it's only as I've become an adult and really got involved with teaching this class that um, I, I don't, I won't say I've become a student of it, of it but I'm, I'm much more, I think I'm much more discerning and trying to figure <laughs> out what the words say. So we have to, uh, the lesson for me is you have to be careful what you say about, <clears throat> about any scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't know what, what kind of influence that will have on someone. But I did. It scared me to death. And I wouldn't yeah. touch it. And in fact, if I saw that that was going to be the subject of the sermon in church, <laughs> I, I would, I'm serious. I would, skip it. I would skip it. I didn't want to hear it. I grew up going to hear pulpit pounding preachers all the time that were talking about fire and brimstone and all of this. And I'd break out in a sweat. <laughs> That's my God. That's not my God. Anyway. Okay. It's time for us to get ready to go to church. So I uh, hope all of you have a great week. And uh, next week we'll conclude. Uh, we make the road by walking. And I'll try to send you out some material so that uh, in the absence of a book or something, at least you maybe have a little bit more information about what we're going to be looking at. Well, also, Marianne, you do get, oh, you did, you said you did. Yeah, but no, we do. Yeah. yeah. I know everyone yeah. who was in our class probably still gets it. So we will take care of that and uh, I'll put that in the process for you. So. Hey, before we go, Donna, Aubrey, are you and Randy doing okay? Uh, we're fine. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, retirement life is kind of easy to get used to. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, well, that's a good thing. And Thank tell you. me, how, how is Erin doing with her <laughs> residency? Is she still enjoying that? She, she is. Yeah, she is. Uh, she, she's, she's doing well in Charlottesville and uh, seems to really like it. Thank you okay. for remembering her. Oh, yeah. Well, good deal. What's Ryan up to? What's Ryan up to? Ryan is, he's still in D.C. working, uh, working remotely. I, I have no idea what it is. It talk it when he tells me what he's doing, it's over my head. So I just say, yeah, <laughs> good job. I always take that as a good sign, Donna. Yeah, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, you all have a wonderful week. I love you all. Be safe. Thank you. Too. Bye -bye. Thank you. Great Bye -bye. job. Good job. Thank you. Bye-bye.